Medieval Dublin, Gaelic Dublin, 800 years ago. Then we moved to Scandinavian Dublin, then up to the 1500s, and you'll see the city gradually moving towards the sea. In terms of the 1820s, the North and South Bull were built, and you'll see Bull Island gradually moving northwards towards the Hoth Peninsula. It'll be there in about 30 to 40 years' time. And when you look at that, you'll see that much of Dublin was once under the sea, and in fact could be again. So the features which facilitated growth over the years and centuries, the fact that we were on the coast, flat land, many rivers with an abundant water supply, they now pose a number of unique challenges with climate change. Um, anybody know where the medieval coastline in Dublin was? Okay. If you actually walk out the door of Dáil Air and on Kildare Street, head down towards Nassau Street, you have a T-junction there, ahead of you is the wall of Trinity College, and then you have a 10-foot drop. Congratulations, you're just now standing on the medieval coastline. It gives you an opportunity to look at Dublin in perhaps a different light. This was 1st of February 2002 when Clontarf was hit by a tidal surge. That's today, that's what it looked like on the 1st of February. Day just like this, half one in the afternoon, no rain, the tide just rose and rose and rose and flooded a thousand properties. That's an example, I suppose, of some of the flooding in the city centre. That's the boardwalk, designed so that it would never, ever, ever, ever go underwater. But of course it did. It affected not only just the immediate coastline, but our national primary road network was also affected. So the impacts spread out from the city centre as well. We activated our Metropolitan Emergency Plan, and with four major flooding events, we had to ask ourselves, has something changed? Are our policies fit for purpose or not? So it was as a result of that that I created something I called the Dublin Flood Initiative. It was modelled on the Dublin Transportation Initiative because 30, 20, well, 20, 30 years ago, the solution to traffic in Dublin was regarded as building more roads. If you built more roads, built bigger roads, you would solve the traffic problem. But of course, that type of thinking was completely unsustainable, and our traffic and transportation policy is now built on public transport, particularly high-quality public transport like the Dart and the Lewis. So the Dublin Flooding Initiative was equally well looking at creating room for the river, room for the rain, and that's a central theme of a project we're working on at the moment called Flood Resilient Cities. If we look at Dublin, it has five main flood hazards, rivers and streams, there are three main rivers in Dublin, the Talca, the Liffey and the Dodder, and we have about 60 small underground rivers. The most problematic one that I have at the moment is out in Dunny Kearney. It's called the Wad. It's flooded three times now in the last four years. The name they tell me is after the Arabic word Wadi, which is a river that only appears above ground in times of heavy rain, which more or less exactly describes that particular river. The dams. We have dams on the river Dodder up at Bornebrina. They provide flood control and also for um, drinking water. If that dam collapsed or failed for any reason, it's a clay core dam, then within two hours you would have Balls Bridge under eight foot of water. Okay, so there are challenges to make sure that we manage those so that that won't happen. And in that particular one, we've built a bypass spillway now so that any major flood that comes will bypass the dams rather than going over the top. Drainage infrastructure, coastal flooding, and finally, extreme intense rainfall, monster rain. So those are the five main flood hazards. And we have in turn five strategies to deal with each one of those five risks. And just to touch on them very briefly, Dams. As I say, two sets of dams. We have dams on the River Liffey as well. Those are managed by the ESB. So if you ever go to Blessington, you see what are known as the Blessington Lakes. They're not lakes. It's a man-made impoundment. It provides drinking water source for the city, and also it makes sure that in a flood that the storms can be held up there so that they're more slowly released down towards the city itself. The average flow in the River Liffey is about 10 tonnes per second. 
the largest flow that's ever come down the River Liffey is about, uh, it's about 140, 150 tonnes per second. Were that dam ever to fail, you're talking about 450 tonnes per second coming down. Every bridge would be washed away and the flooding would extend to a mile every side of the river. So again, these are risks, but these are risks that we manage. Any water release from that impoundment arrives in the city about 18 hours later. So we have to make sure that we time any water releases so that they don't coincide with high tide. In terms of coastal, as a result of the flooding in 2002, we've now invested a lot in our coastal flood defences. If you ever go down by the Convention Centre, the new Samuel Beckett Bridge, you'll see a 7 million euro floodgate there that's designed to protect the East Wall Road area, just on the left-hand side of the Convention Centre. In terms of rivers, we use what's called the CFRAM process, Catchment Flood Risk Assessment and Management Plans, to look at each river, identify what infrastructure needs to be put in place to protect the city. In terms of drainage, our Greater Dublin Strategic Drainage Study identifies not only a future course for drainage in the city, but also looking at how we must develop sustainable drainage systems. And finally then, pluvial flooding. This is addressed as part of our Flood Resilient City project, and I'll just share a bit of detail with you on that in a moment. But looking at the, the longer term vision for Dublin, well, in the future, we have two projects. One of them is called Project 2030. That's looking at whether or not a tidal barrage is necessary for Dublin. Now, we've carried out pre-feasibility studies because the first thing I wanted to check is if you built a barrage there and you closed it, would you protect the city from the sea while it flooded from the land, from the rain that would also fall? And the good news is you could build something there. Would you ever build a barrage like that? No, because you couldn't afford it. The, if you're to build something like that, it has to be integrated into the urban fabric of the city. So a good example of that is over in Singapore, where they built just such a barrage. It was called the Marina Barrage Project. cost them a billion dollars, but as a result of that, they developed land which is worth 10 billion to them in, in the city. So any structures like that would have to be integrated into the future shape of the city. And beyond that, we have Project 2050. We know our sea levels are going to rise, and we know there is a practical limit to which shore-based defences can protect the city. So we're looking at the possibility of offshore islands. They could even be underwater offshore islands, if that doesn't sound too bizarre. And the intention then is to break the stormy seas offshore so that you protect the inner harbour. These again are concepts, and over the next seven years now we'll be working with our planners in the development plan to see how those thoughts and ideas might integrate into the next city development plan. We hope, by the way, that by 2050, that wave energy and tidal energy will be sufficiently developed as a product that we can integrate that into the structure, perhaps to provide sustainable energy into the future for the entire city of Dublin. So as I say, possible solutions, they're only concepts at this stage, but it's by thinking of ideas like that into the future that you promote and stimulate discussion. And as I hope I've shown you earlier on, the city that we have now, the city as you look around, it wasn't here 800 years ago, and it's definitely not going to be in the same shape 100 years from now. We work very closely with the European Union on a number of individual projects. Uh, the SAFER project, if you want to get any money from the European Union for any project, you need a good acronym. So I came up with the idea of SAFER. Everybody wants to be a little bit safer, and it stands for Strategies and Actions for Flood Emergency Management. So that gave us a tidal surge forecasting system for Dublin. We worked on the NOAA project, and that just says if you've got a lot of rain coming down, at a particular point, you don't know whether it's going to go away and cause you no problem, or whether it's going to lead to a major emergency. So trying to integrate where those decision points actually are. Our Flood Resilient City project is working with a number of partners, each one looking at their own theme, to try to make sure that our city can adapt to climate change. A good example of that is one of our partner cities is Paris. God bless them, the last flood they had was 1911, over 100 years ago. But if they get what they call a 1 in 200 year flood, then one third of Paris is going to be underwater for three months. So if you just think about that and the challenges facing urban planners in making sure that the city form could adapt to such a challenge. And then finally working on climate change adaptation into the future. 
We're also working with IBM, I touched on that earlier on, looking to see can we have a Deep Thunder application in Dublin. Now anything to do with IBM and the word deep means lots and lots of money. Deep Thunder is a numerical modeling mo which hopefully will predict future intense rainstorms. It's operational at the moment in two countries only. In New York State, their electricity company operated to try to, um, I suppose, pre-deploy resources in advance of a storm. So if they know there's going to be a storm in perhaps Albany, 400 miles away, they'll roll the repair crews from New York State and uh, New York City to be there as the storm arises so that they can fix the electricity system quite quickly. They have it in Rio as well, and their challenge down there is particularly the favelas, the slums, um, and Darren might be quite familiar with those. If you get rainstorms in poorly constructed slums, then death can be the outcome. So again, they're using it there, and it's a little bit of our feather in their cap to see that this research tool is now coming to Dublin to see if it can help predict flooding in Dublin. Our Flood Resilient City project, looking at pluvial flooding, this was last October. And that is the geographic distribution of flooding. Every single one of those red dots was a single flood location. And the challenge for pluvial flooding is some of them are associated with rivers or old rivers, but some are not. And you're just as likely to be flooded on top of a hill as you are at the bottom of a hill with this particular weather phenomenon. It's not forecastable in advance in terms of when it will arrive or where it will arrive. And that's why we're trying to work with IBM to see at the limits of science and technology what we might be able to do in terms of advanced forecasting. So in very simple terms, the study we've just completed now is looking at rainfall forecasting, trying to find out what are the characteristics of this, carrying out a citywide pluvial assessment, what are the areas at risk, looking at codes of practice for new development or retrofitting existing development with sustainable drainage systems. Maybe a simple example of that, underground car park. The value of assets, cars in an underground car park could be two to three million. In the event that a flood comes, first of all, the water will start to enter that underground car park. The fire brigade may very well arrive and they have nowhere to put their suction hoses. So there's very little that they can do to prevent flooding. Whereas if you had a small little sump at the entrance, you have somewhere for the fire brigade to put their hoses and you have a way of mitigating that. So this is the way we have to think a little bit smarter about our new developments. Looking then at forecasting, looking at the whole area of what you might be able to do, carrying out pilots there with uh, sustainable drainage systems into the future. So that's our template. Nearly finished, I think I'm probably all right for time. Somebody wave if I'm five minutes, great, we're just on time. Currently, in terms of nationally, we have a national flood agency, which is the Office of Public Works. Met Aaron are our national, uh, sorry, let me just go back on that for a moment. Met Aaron are our weather forecasting and weather warning agency. RTE as public service broadcaster give out weather warnings. And Dublin City at the moment, we're the local flood warning and flood management agency. As I said, we at the moment have our tidal forecasting system for Dublin. There are 713 tides every year, two tides a day. The astronomical tide is determined by the position of the sun, the moon, and the stars. Doesn't really change. You can forecast it for centuries ahead, and you're never going to have a flood unless it's accompanied by an extreme event. Extreme event, if you have high pressure, low pressure, wind speed, wind direction, that means that you may have a risk. We're able to look ahead at each one of the high tides, determine whether there is or is not a risk for Dublin, and the system at the moment that we've put in is accurate to plus or minus 50 millimeters. So that's an exceptionally high level of accuracy. As well as telling us when we have a problem, it also tells us when we haven't a problem. Anytime some of our media, and I won't just mention the Evening Herald in particular, but anytime they're short of a headline on a Friday evening, um, Dublin about to be flooded, monster flood, it really uh, fills up the front of a newspaper. And we're able to say, nope, Sorry, based on the scientific information, there is not a particular problem. Uh, this was Clontarf uh, in October of this year and Sandy Mount. We had a close call. We had the eighth and tenth highest tides in a century. Okay, if you look there from the year 2000 onwards, something has changed. We've had an extreme event every year bar one since the year 2002. So climate change, global warming, whatever it is, is definitely with us. I'm afraid when the name global warming was first coined, 
It sounded as if it was something rather nice. Okay, we could all do with warm weather, um, maybe gra grapes and vineyards down in Wexford. But the reality is extremely variable climate on a daily basis. And if you want a simple example of that, think back to the extreme weather there two years ago. And on the day of the thaw, we moved in Dublin from minus 18 degrees to plus 18 degrees. That's a 38 degree temperature shift in 18 hours. So again, that's an example of how climate change and its impacts are with us now. And just to finish, what happened if Hurricane Sandy were to come to Dublin? Okay, well, I got my people actually to do an examination of that and see what would the outcome be. That was, I suppose, 17th of October this year. That was what the high tide was, 2.5 metres. And they say it could go up to 3.3 metres. Don't worry too much about the numbers, but that gave me a metric to say that if that type of hurricane were to come to Dublin, we can calculate the impact and we can calculate the areas that would be at risk. And that obviously means that we can put the necessary evacuation plans into place. Obviously, it would bring with it wave, wind-blown spray, whatever. And that's, I suppose, an example of the sort of limits on technology. There are practical limits to shore-based defences. Last so slide. What are the other challenges facing us in the future? Well, the answer is, I suppose, we don't know. But as urban planners, we must be prepared for them. But all joking aside, the only thing that's fanciful about that slide is the type of boat. As I told you earlier on, Trinity was once underwater and is actually in the floodplain of the River Liffey. So I hope that's given you some food for thought, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.